Our service tonight from the book of Genesis, chapter 15, the sins of the Ammonites not complete. Or another way to put it, why would a loving God wipe out whole nations, including women and children? Right? That's a valid question. Right? That's a question on a lot of people's mind, whether they read the Bible and believe in the Bible or who have just heard about God, uh, atheists, agnostics, uh, we'll throw that out. If God is so loving, then uh, why does the Bible describe uh, him calling for the destruction of people groups? That's a valid question. So by God's grace, we'll see what the Bible has to say on this topic. And we'll see it in context of this account in Genesis chapter 15 of Abraham and God confirming the covenant with him. So starting in verse 7, God said to Abram, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And we've seen that promise several times along that line. And so God reiterating it again for Abraham. Verse 8, Abraham said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he, God, said to him, Abram, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. I don't know how old the pigeon was or the turtle dove, uh, but it's a good thing God, uh, Abraham was keeping track of the ages of the ram for God to tell him, this is what I want, a three-year-old. Okay, I got one. I got his date right here. And so uh, Abraham brings these sacrifices. He brought all of these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece on opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. So you got half a ram, half a ram, half a heifer, half a heifer, uh, half uh, one bird, another bird, and and whatever the other animal was, half and half. So he places them there with an alley between them um, for this ceremony of this covenant. And verse 12, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, And he beheld horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. Also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward they shall come out with great possessions. This is prophetic, hundreds of years in advance. And later on, we get to the book of Exodus, we see that is exactly what God did. And so for 400 years, God's saying, your descendants are going to experience troubles. Verse 16, in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. That's where we're getting this theme for this week, that for some reason, we're not going to be able to return for four generations, and at that time, a generation was 100 years. I'm glad it's not that long now. I don't want to live that long, right? So anyway, so uh, a 100-year generation. Abraham lives 175, I think. So fourth generation, 400 years. Then we will be able to come back, come back, but we will not be able to come back until the iniquity of the Amorites is complete kind of a key there, very interesting text, very insightful for us to understand a little bit of God's workings among humanity and his mercy towards the Amorites. And he could just wipe them out then, but he says, no, the cup of iniquity is not yet fulfilled. I'm going to give them another 400 years before the judgment comes upon them. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried at a good old age. So that's kind of comforting. Right? Don't worry about it, Abraham. I'm told you what's going to happen to your descendants four generations from now, but don't worry. It's going to be okay with you. <laughs> You're not going to be afflicted. You're not going to have to go into bondage. You're going to be okay. You're going to live a long old age, and then you'll drop dead. Uh, you'll be buried. You, you're You're okay. But your kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, great-great-grandkids, it's going to be tough on them. 
And uh, I mean, I would, you know, you, have you ever even think about what four generations down <laughs> from you now? I mean, are you worried about them? Are you thinking about them? You know, I mean, could you imagine 400 years from now? Ah, who cares what happens to them? <laughs> 400 years from now, you know, what my descendants going to be? Uh, I haven't heard from my kids lately, and I'm going to worry about four generations <laughs> from now, you know? So, uh, so God just lays it out for them. 400 years, your descendants are going to be in bondage, and then they're going to come back here. Okay, well, I'm not going to hang around and wait. Uh, that's fine. So God kind of lays that all out for Abraham, tells him you will die at a good old age. And when the sun went down and it was dark, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. The Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gergesites, the Jebusites, the Termites, the Parasites, and the Anti-Semites. <laughs> and that's about what happened, right? That's about what happened, right? So, that's what the Bible says. That's what says. Quoting right from, the, right from the Bible. You know, this is, it shows how accurate the Bible is and how you can rely on it. It says here, when the sun went down, it was dark. That is just profound biblical truth there, right? So you, you, can, you can hold that fast. You can know that uh, when the sun goes down, it gets dark. The Bible says so. But here's the Lord making this covenant with Abraham, promising him, and doing so by passing through an image of a torch of fire. Right? So God uh, demonstrates himself as fire a few different times in the Bible. We see the pillar of fire, God in the pillar of fire, God in the fire with the bush with Moses. And so here, passing through, maybe even burning the sacrifices as he went through, doesn't specifically mention, but the fire going between the two sacrifices in other words, accepting the sacrifice. Now, like he did with Elijah, a little differently, but with Elijah, fire coming down from heaven and burning up the sacrifice and the altar and the water, demonstrating God's acceptance of it. And, and uh, I think with uh, Solomon, too, the fire comes down and consumes the sacrifice for Solomon, demonstrating God's acceptance and confirming the covenant. Abraham asked, how do I know? Well, watch this. <laughs> fire coming down and going right through the midst of the, uh, the sacrifices that Abraham had laid out for him. And so God walking in his midst in the power of the fire and the power of his presence, revealing himself to Abraham and revealing himself as a merciful God to the Amorites and a God of promises to Abraham and his descendants and a God who knows the future at least four generations into the future, 400 years into the future, knowing what's going to happen, and God's concern for Abraham's descendants, his watch care over them. They're going to experience affliction, but I'm going to bring them out, and I'm going to bring them out with great possessions, and I'm going to bring judgment on those that afflicted them. So God's demonstrating himself in the fire, in the covenant, in the promises, in the demonstration of power, and in the demonstrations of mercy, love, long-suffering for both the Amorites and Abraham's descendants. And so, back to this text, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So God gives a time. God gives mercy. God gives an extension to their lives. Why God brought Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees? Why didn't he just leave him there until the Time of the Amorites was, was done, I don't know, but they brought him out, brought him into the land, showed him the land, only to have us leave for 400 years, and then come back. But the Amorites, it doesn't mention the other groups here, termites and anti-Semites and parasites, but the, but the Amorites, their iniquity is not yet complete. So there is some point in time, there is some point of level that God considers sin being complete for individuals and for people groups. And when that is complete, and I imagine looking at the rest of the scriptures, has to do with when, no matter how many more opportunities he gives to the people, no matter how much more mercy, no matter how much more demonstrations of love and blessings or in judgments and warnings, 
they're not going to change their minds. Their hearts are made up like stone, like concrete, mixed up and permanently set. They're not going to change, and their, their iniquity is complete. I don't think it's a level of iniquity. If it was a level of iniquity, boy, I think we'd be in heaven already. You know, or, but it's not based on that. It's not like God gets too angry, I can't take it anymore, and the Hulk you know, just bursts out. But he's waiting in long suffering until each has had an opportunity in that people group. And when they've made their decision for God or against God. As God describes himself to Moses, or repeated here, but uh, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come in which the elements will melt with fervent heat. Since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? So God's not willing that any should perish. He's long-suffering. He's wanting all to come to repentance. But at the same time, the day of the Lord will come. There will be a judgment. And this is based, I forgot to put the text in, but I think what's going through Peter's mind is where God pronounces uh, to Moses, I am the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, long-suffering, patient, forgiving iniquity to the third and fourth generation, but will in no wise clear the guilty, or to the thousandth generation, but will in no wise clear the guilty to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. And so here again, there's balance here, where God is long-suffering, doesn't want anyone to perish, loving, poured out his spirit, given time and opportunity, chances. But there is a judgment day as well. So it's kind of, I think, a very nice balance where we have groups that just want to condemn everyone who doesn't think, look, act just like them. And then you got others who think everybody's going to heaven. All dogs go to heaven. Everybody's there. You know, and that's not reality either. Right? So balance of both. And again, it's not based so much on God's displeasure. One day he's impatient and one day he just had a bad day and so let's knock them out. But it's based on the choices that people have made. And so God pours out his spirit, gives everyone a chance. And obviously long, Amorites 400 years on top of what they've already had. Extends the period of time as long as possible. That's one of the reasons we're still here. God's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, wanting all to come to repentance. And waiting on us to hasten the day of God. How can we hasten it? By living godly lives. What manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? So that the world can see God demonstrated again in the flesh through this flesh, through the Holy Spirit, living through us. And when they see and hear it demonstrated, then God can hold them accountable. Then they can make their decision for God or against God based on a visual demonstration of true love, a balanced love, not a codependent love that God walked all over forever, but a God that's patient, long-suffering, but also has standards and a time limit, not so much time as far as days, but a level of limit of where we can harden our hearts so hard that it gets where it can't be penetrated by the grace of God, where we close off our ears to hearing him any longer. And I don't think it's that God stops calling, that the Holy Spirit stops moving, but kind of like the alarm clock. You know, if you hit the snooze button long enough, it gets to the point where you no longer even hear it anymore, right? You can just sleep right through it. That's me. It takes a lot. <laughs> Wake me up. I can sleep right through almost any alarm clock, right? You just ignore it to the point where it's still going off, but you're not hearing it anymore. If we continually to resist God and block him out and ignore him, he'll continue to plead 
The blood has already been offered in our behalf. The Messiah has already given himself. The Father has already given his most precious possession for the sins of the world. So that can't be taken back. He won't take that back. The offer is there. But if it's resisted and resisted and resisted, we get to the point where we don't even believe it and won't accept it and won't see it, even though it's right there for us to see. And so that's, I think, part of the explanation. That we, groups get to a point that God knows, he knows the future, and if they just stay around any longer, they're just going to continue to cause more trouble, and more people are going to refuse God's love. They're going to be a demonstration for evil, and it's over for them anyway because they've hardened their hearts so much. And that, I think, makes is reasonable and sensible to anybody who has a heart. He's long-suffering, but there needs to be a time of judgment. I mean, if you were the owner of a home, would you let someone in that home that's constantly uh, resisting and rebelling against whatever rules you have for the home? I don't know. People do it all the time. <laughs> it's not wise. <laughs> but there are codependent people who let people who come in, the children, let them roll, roll, rule the house. Uh, but a sensible, logical person would say, no, I'm not going to let them come in here and just continually disregard everything that I hold precious. But God won't. God's not codependent. So he's balanced. And he won't let people into heaven who don't want to be there. They won't be happy there. They'd be miserable there. God forced someone into heaven whose heart and life demonstrated he doesn't trust God, he rebels against God, might profess to love God, but in heart and mind, any area, one area, where he's resistant to God, on a consistent, continual, willful, rebellious basis, he wouldn't be happy in heaven. Heaven is all about loving God. Heaven is all about praising God. Heaven is all about worshiping and following and walking in harmony with God. So any heart that is resistant to that would be totally miserable in listening to the praises of God and obedience and service to him, loving service from a loving God. And so here on earth as well, we get to the point where we totally resist long enough that, well, you've had your chances. And again, I think that makes logic and sense regarding the adults. But what about the children? What about innocent children? How bad could a two-year-old, three-year-old be that God says, tough luck, wipe them out, a one-year-old, a six-month-old, wipe them out? And there are times, you know, the fire and brimstone came down on everybody in those cities, no matter what their age was. And there are other times God told Moses, David, others, go wipe out whole villages, whole cities, whole nations. It's all, everyone whatever their age is. So what about the children? Well, that's a good question. So where should we go for the answer? The Bible. The Bible. That's a good idea. Right? That's a great idea. Let's go to the Bible. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 24, it says the same thing in a few different ways. Yet it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. So even Sodom and Gomorrah that gets wiped out with fire and brimstone, everybody in it, children and adults, God says it's not over for the, even those who lived in Sodom. The final judgment has not yet happened for them. Oh, a judgment here on earth, but that's not the end. There'll be a final judgment, and in that final judgment, it'll be more tolerable. In other words, they have a better chance of getting into heaven than those living in Capernaum at that time. And thus, better chance than those living here right now. Because those in Capernaum, and certainly us, have a lot more opportunities to know and see God 
and to accept his love or reject his love. So God in the judgment will weigh out the thoughts, the mind, the intent of the heart based on what they had opportunity to know and experience. What did Sodom have? It had Lot and his wife and two daughters. No thanks. I mean, not much of a witness right there. And Abraham up in the hills. They didn't have much. Now, they did have Abraham went and did deliver them. And so they saw that. So they had some opportunity. And obviously, they didn't appreciate it and rejected it. And so God said, enough for you guys for now. But in the judgment, God will take into consideration those children, those that didn't have a full knowledge or ability, take into consideration what decision would they have made if they had the evidence that people living in the last days do? What would their decision be if they had the whole Bible? What would their decision be if they had a good, godly missionary sent to them? If they saw it lived out and demonstrated out in their lives, as it was in Abraham. And God will take that into consideration. Weighs everyone's tears, puts them in a bottle, looks at the books, says, I know where you were born. Takes all that into consideration. Weighs it all out in the judgment. And then we'll have his judgment based on God's mercy scale. Again, not everyone goes to heaven. It doesn't say everyone from Sodom is going to heaven. He just says it'll be more tolerable. It doesn't mean that anyone from Sodom will be in heaven. It just says it'll be more tolerable. Just an easier scale judgment upon them than upon those living in Capernaum. And again, certainly more so than upon us. And so God, for the children, and not all children will necessarily go to heaven, but God in the judgment will do what is right regarding every single individual. And certainly it would be better for the children if they're raised in a godly family, certainly if they're raised in a society, in a country, that allows freedom of thought and freedom of religion and freedom to read the Bible and to hear the Bible and be taught Bible songs and the scriptures. Certainly, it'll be easier in the judgment for them and better in this life as well. But God is concerned and loves everyone. And he's concerned on the big picture the eternal picture. And so dying here is no big deal. You get caught up in some fire and brimstone, it's not the end of the world. It might be the end of this world, but it's not the end of God's eternal world. And that's what counts. And that's where our focus needs to be. That's where our mind needs to be. We need to be hastening God's coming by demonstrating and going to the whole world, including our neighbor. As far away as that is including to that person at work or that person in school, and going and sharing God's love with them, the person at the store and everywhere we go. As we drive down the road, get a good bumper sticker. Right? Be proclaiming God's love. Get a good shirt and get a good hat. And be proclaiming God's truth everywhere we go. Warning the world and letting them know. And then demonstrating it and living it out in our lives so that they can experience the joy of the Lord here and for eternity. So I think God is a balanced God, a good God. We'll take everything in consideration in his love and his judgment. And so that's why he allows things to happen here, because here is not that important. It really isn't. We put too much upon this here and now than God does. We're holding on to really just sand, smoke to a vapor that's here today, gone tomorrow. One time a generation was 100 years, and now it's less. It's gone. Not that big a deal. It's passing. Keep our eyes on the eternal. On God's eternal plan. 
God's everlasting plan, an everlasting life in the new heavens and in the new earth, paid for by the blood of Messiah, given to us freely, without cost to us, great cost to him. What does cost us? It costs us our sins, costs us our carnal nature, costs us the deplorable so-called pleasures of this world. We give them up. We get so much in return. Focus on those things. Focus on God's everlasting life and share that and give that to others before the final judgment day, before the sins of the Amorites is complete. And I think it's getting pretty full pretty quickly. And the longer we delay in getting the message out there, the more the devil is stealing away souls for eternity. It is despicable what we're seeing happening in society today. And it's really horrible that religious institutions are accepting it, embracing it, and going along with it. We need to be a light in this dark world. Because when the sun goes down, it's dark. Work while it is day, for night is coming when no one will be able to work. We have a short time left to get the message out there. We have a short time left to win and save those that are lost. There are billions, millions perishing for a want of the knowledge and love and touch of God. God is calling us to share it with them. And if we don't, who will? And so as we pray, This has helped you to see the mercy of God a little better. Maybe you've wondered in the back of your mind, consciously or subconsciously, what about these children that God has allowed to and even called upon and even brought fire and physically himself killed and destroyed? Helped you see the mercy of God even in that. The bigger picture, the eternal picture. In a moment we pray, you can thank God and praise God for that. If you're seeing the mercy of God a little better, patience, long-suffering, and that he gave the Amorites another 400 years, in a moment we can thank God for that as well. If you're sensing God's calling upon your life to live holy, godly lives as we see the day approaching so that we can hasten his coming, and you want the Holy Spirit to fill you and empower you with holiness, with righteousness. Then a moment when we pray, as for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, to live in you and through you. If God is being merciful to you right now in extending his time on your, your life so that you will repent, if he's being long-suffering upon you, not wanting that you should perish, that he's wanting you to repent, if there's some area in your life that he's revealing to you, that he's reminding you, that he's convicting you, that he wants you to repent now, before it's too late. Last week, at our other congregation, we did a funeral, and just days before the funeral, the son of the person who the funeral was for, he got a message that a very close friend of his died in a car accident. So he's grieving both. That's a funeral for his father, his close friend, he's going home to a second funeral. That quickly. His father lasted a long time, had plenty of opportunity. So the person, in a second, went from pulling out of a parking lot of a supermarket to dead. None of us know how much time we have. 
While God has extended your time, you're here today, you're sensing the Holy Spirit convicting you of even just one area in your life that would just make you miserable in heaven. Just one area in your life, Adam and Eve, it just took one sin. One area in your life that would keep you out of heaven. Turn it over to the Lord tonight. Now surrender it to him, confess it, confess it. accept the Messiah's sacrifice, accept God's forgiveness upon your life, and accept the Holy Spirit to give you power and victory in that area. And if that applies to you, let God do his work. That's the moment when we pray. If God's bringing to your mind a certain person or people group, that he wants you to specifically share his gospel with. Maybe it's the full gospel, maybe it's speaking to it, maybe it's sharing a word, or maybe it's just a gospel demonstrated. Cutting their grass, painting their house, bringing them a loaf of bread, whatever it is. God's bringing someone to your mind that he's calling you to live out holiness and godliness too. In a moment when we pray, Ask for God's strength and Holy Spirit power to fulfill that calling and to follow through with it. And for God to go before you, to send his angels before you, to soften that person's heart and make them open and receptive to receiving God's truth, God's love. So if any of those areas apply to your life, let's pray and let God move. We thank you, Lord, for your great love for all humanity, your patience here with us, 6,000 years of misery going on. Thank you for your long suffering. Lord, we ask forgiveness for using our time unwisely, for wasting it away on frivolity and useless activities. Forgive us and cleanse us. Forgive us for not warning the world already by now. Forgive us for allowing the devil to pass us up and present lies before we've even started to tie our shoes to go and present truth. Forgive us for our own individual sins and personal sins. Convict us. Cleanse us. Give us the gift of repentance. Turn us. Change us. Fill us with your spirit. And live in us and out of us. Go before us to those who need to see you and know you. Soften their hearts and minds. Win them for your kingdom. May we not be among those that delay your coming. May we make our decision for you, wholly and completely, now and for eternity. In Yeshua's holy name. Amen.